The Absurd and Fantastical is a brand new website where I will be posting new articles every week. So if you like interesting facts and interesting fiction, come check it out. It's the place where fantasy meets absurdity. In the hot humid deserts of India, surrounded by the ebb and flow of crowds and thick-scented spices of markets, one might come across the curious sight of a horse with cold ears. They are called the Mawari, meaning from the land of death, and much like the arid deserts of Marwar, they are strong, resilient, and they endure. They are known today as the pride of India, for within the chest of a Marwari beats the heart of a warrior whose loyalty has become legendary. Considered the national horse of India, the Mawari today are honored and revered, as woven into the land and its history as the mighty elephant. The Rajput clan's descendants of warriors have kept the breed alive throughout its long existence, but the history of the Mawari tells one of war, conquest, and even of great misery. According to the ancient Vedic scriptures, the Mawari, like all horses, came from the seven-headed horse king, Uchairasharava, born from the primordial, churning waters. All horses sprang forth from this magnificent deity. The Manipur pony, Spiti, Zanskari, and the distant cousin of the Mawari, the Kathiawari. But unlike his brethren, the Mawari was once as exalted and admired as the mythological horse king. In his prime, the Mawari was considered to be above even royalty. But the true origin of the Mawari, as they say, has been lost to the mists of time. Many a theory has been proposed, from Arabs barely surviving a sinking ship and scrambling up on the shores of India, to a distant lineage, to either Mongolian ponies or even the now extinct Quaha. Recent studies, though, suggest the Mawari has no connection to the Arabian horses and is wholly a breed native to India. But most accept that the story of the Mawari begins with the Ratores from the Rajput clan. The Ratores were a fierce warrior clan who lived in Kanaju. After a brutal and epic battle, they were driven from their homes and into the deserts and the arid plains of Marwar, the land of death. In these harsh and ruthless conditions, their horses adapted, able to survive on scant cups of water, little food, and pushing on through the heat and cold for days on end. Their mounts survived, and so too did the Rathors. The Rathors would gain strength once more in these barren wastes, and in this time during the 12th century, they started a strict breeding program for their horses, and much of what they looked for is still kept in the breed today. They are bred strong, yet slim, with an upright shoulder enabling the horse to pull its hooves out of the sand. Although not as swift as the racing thoroughbred, their endurance is excellent and they are well suited to their desert homes. Their coats are silky and soft, helping to cope with the harsh heat of the desert and seemingly built in they have an excellent sense of direction. When lost, trust your mount to guide you home. The ears of the Mawari can turn 180 degrees, a unique feature of the breed, and despite its lyre-shaped ears or most likely because of it, horse has very fine hearing. This feature is also the first characteristic to disappear when interbreeding occurs, thus the ears of the Mawari are a true symbol of its purity. Much of the old folklore has carried over to modern-day breeders. A black horse, for example, is considered unlucky, as it represents death, but a blaze and four socks are considered very lucky, and a grey is a favourite, but pure white is not considered a true Mawari, and are instead called Nukra, and are a unique breed on their own. The position of the whorls is also very important. A whorl down the neck is called a devman and is considered good luck, whereas one beneath the eye is called an anush dal and is not favorable for the rider. For the longest time, only the royalty and the Rajput warrior castes were allowed to own and ride these horses. Their beauty, coupled with their stamina and sense of direction, were prized attributes for traveling in the scorching deserts, and their courage in battle was certainly unrivaled. At one point, they had bred and fielded a force of over 50,000 men and horses for the Mongol Empire. In battle, the horses had no equal. They were brave, resilient, and never faltered. The Rajput boasts of horses charging elephants, leaping walls, and rising on hind legs to protect their fallen riders. The legends say that a Mawari would only stop fighting for three reasons. If the rider turned him from the field, if his rider was wounded and he had to be carried away to safety, or if the horse perished. And there are many stories to support this. Chetak, the famous blue mount of Rana Pratap, once charged an elephant in battle. Rising up on his hind legs, he offered his rider a good shot at their enemy. The elephant's tusks, though, were sharpened, point and capped with a spike, and it tore into the horse's leg, but Chetak refused to budge. Only when his rider pulled him away did the horse obey, hobbling to a six-foot wide stream and leaping over it to give his rider a chance to escape safely. He died in Ranapratap's arms, but Chetak's bravery ensured his king would survive and continue to protect his people. 
A statue has been mounted in Udapir and Haldagati to honor the deceased horse and his bravery. Another story tells of Bahadur. After killing Slabat Khan and Arga's red fort, Amar Singh made his escape upon his fine horse Bahadur. Surrounded by the enemy and with nowhere out, the horse raced to the top of the battlements and leapt off the high wall of the fort. Bahadur would not survive the fall, but he left the men of the fort so bewildered that his master could escape. A small shrine has been erected in memory of the brave horse. But these few names are not the only ones to be remembered. Arbut was a famous war horse of Vir Durga Daji, a brilliant warrior and technician. Jitta carried his rider hundreds of miles to save his life, and other names to be remembered are Kaiser Kalmi, Hana, Udal, Ankara, all of which served their masters in their wars with unrivaled bravery. Horses charging elephants, leaping battlements, and staying on the field to protect their riders are stories and legends carried over for many a year. But there is a larger point to this, as Jai Xing says. The larger picture is that Indian history would be different had not the rulers of Marwar created and celebrated this magnificent horse. And it is easy to believe that without the bravery, tenacity and endurance of the Mawari, India might have been a far different place today. Their bravery often saved key characters in battles. And should those men have instead perished, India might have taken a far different route. The Mawari are, beyond their bravery and courage, beautiful, and many owners back then and today enjoy their easy trot, their gated walk and soft nature. And some horses could even carry the strain of Nachni, which simply means a born to dance. A brilliant performance by horse and handler, the Nachni, gives the Mawari the ability to dance, mostly for crowds. Although many believe the true strain has faded almost completely from the breed, some still manage to perform fully, giving us glimpses of the fine performance they once were. For many years, the Rajas, princes made up of supporters of the British Empire, took great pride in owning and bettering the breed. They were the only ones allowed to breed and keep their liar ear beauties. For even a prince's status, after all, was still far beneath the horse, who was still considered greater than even royalty. Even though the British in their arrogance had no time or care for the Mawari and insisted using their fine thoroughbreds, this particularly had begun a slow descent of the breed, and as more and more thoroughbreds were used in India, the Mawari was delegated to fewer and fewer battles. The last battle for the Mawari would be in 1917 under General Albany. But this bravery and strength would be no match for a sudden social movement within India. Independence. In the 1900s, the Indian people started pushing for independence from British rule. In order to do so, the princes had to sign away their royal rights. This ensured they were no longer supporting the British and they could begin a united front for independence. This was all orchestrated under the leadership of Iron Man Patel, who encouraged all princes to give up their titles, most of them obliged. Shortly after this, a land reform was announced, and because none of the ex-princes had any claim to their lands anymore, most of it was seized. This meant that stables filled with horses had nowhere to go, and the princes had little choice but to deal with them. Thousands of horses were shot and killed in order to alleviate the sheer amount and to prevent the lower classes from obtaining them. But many more were still given to the lower classes, who had a dismaying reaction to the horse. The peasants saw the Mawari as a symbol of tyranny, embodying a time when they were under the thumb of self decreed princes. Princes who had once levied taxes on them. To abolish the legacy of this time in India completely, they castrated the stallions and ended up putting down more. Those that did survive were used as beasts of burden. In a very short time, the once regal and proud Mawari warrior had fallen from beloved royalty to hated cart horse. Without the knowledge of breeding and lineings, the Mawari was interbred with other horses, slowly losing its pure bloodlines. The horse kept fading and falling, and for a time it seemed as if the whole world was determined to snuff out the fire of the Mawari. But in 1990, two people from India, a man named Raghuvendra Boni Singh Dandlod and an American horsewoman named Francesca Kelly, established the Indigenous Horse Society of India, a foundation set on preserving the once pride of India. As tourism picked up and memories of princes faded, the community realized how curious these cold-eared beauties were, and more and more people fought to keep the Mawari alive and well. It has been over 30 years, and progress is slow, but the Mawari's blood has been revived. Another man who has been influential in the survival of the breed is His Highness Maharaja Gajin II. After announcing his interest in bringing the breed back from the brink, he went to visit the Kani of Badgoan, where some of the finest Mawaris were being bred. Before his departure, he was to select one colt to take home with him. They were all from the people's prized stallion, Vangalia. The horses were lined up and ready for Maharaja. 
but upon the advice of his aides, he dismissed the colts and asked Thakur, a nobleman, to bring forth the prized stallion. The Thakur was dismayed, but did as he was told. A few months later, Vangalia walked into the quad. His mere presence demanded attention. Bright, beautiful, handsome, big and proud, he was led around the quad showing off his slick movement and perfect conformation, and finally brought before his royal spectator. His Highness was quiet, placing a hand on the muzzle of the proud stallion, and with a smile he said, Vangalia cannot leave but go on. He has given a lot to this breed, and where he is now he is perfectly stationed, where mares from the whole of South Marwar will benefit. The Thakur smiled with relief, and Maharaja chose a fine colt from the stock before departing. Today, only 5,000 Marwari still remain. They are used for tent pegging, endurance riding, marriages and celebrations of all sorts. Once embodying the dismal memory of a British rule, it now instead represents what it always was, the tenacity and beauty of India, embodied in the cold ears of a horse.